the big question for the people in the audience. What makes a good club? What do you see at the hallmarks of a successful football club, wherever in the world? Thank you very much, Nick. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. It's a really a pleasure to be here, especially in this beautiful country. Um, so what I see in football clubs all around the world, well, uh, at FIFA, as you know, we have uh, several activities and projects with clubs, so we have the opportunity to see those common things that clubs that are well run um, implement right in their strategy and to summarize i think there are three three key things so the first thing is a clear strategy on youth development and infrastructure that means a sustainable business sporting model especially those clubs that are not elite clubs that are not top clubs understand that if they want to um, perform well on and off the pitch, they have to have a sustainable business model. They cannot rely on sporting results, but they have to make sure they can implement a player development strategy that they can also uh, build up the infrastructure that both allow the development of players, but also the creation of new source of revenues. The second aspect is uh, having a long-term strategy. What I get to see is that most of the cases, the discussions in board meetings are more about the next game, are more about the short-term goals. Only about the next game. I actually don't see a lot of discussions about where do we want our club to be in 20 years time. It's too long term. And I think this is clear because this has to see with the third aspect that in my opinion is very important. That is uh, everything that is not tangible because, you know, of course, those clubs that have the best players in the long run win more. But there are certain intangible factors, the so-called X factors, as I call it, that are the key ingredients for success, both on and off the pitch, and are the creation of a club culture, the creation of values, the alignment with those values, but also the sense of belonging, the creation of a sense of community for, for the clubs, for the, for the fans, and for all that um, work in the club. So, um, summary, uh, making a summary of what I just said, but trying also to uh, see the practical implementation, no? also based on my experience, because I work for FIFA, but I've been involved uh, over the last, well, in for more than six years in uh, a management of a, what was a, an amateur club at the start, right? So, I helped the ownership bring in the club from actually the lowest division of Spanish football to the second division, so to professional football. And I remember a lot of discussions with the family, with the ownership, right? I was doing it just as a hobby on my free time. But they were obsessed with sporting results, so they wanted to get to the first division. They wanted to play the Champions League, and we were in the lowest division of Spanish football. And I was insisting on the importance of creating a very unique identity, a very unique uh, culture, values that fans could identify themselves with. And also, of course, everything must be reflected on the brand positioning, right? And you have to be consistent because what you write in, on paper must then be implemented. So I remember at the beginning, we were amateur club, lowest division of Spanish football. The kit supplier was Adidas. And there was, of course, a strategic decision because we wanted to be associated with a premium brand. So then, uh, after a few years, we were already in the third division and we got an offer from another kit supplier. And the offer was financially very significant. Actually, with Adidas, we weren't getting any money at all from Adidas. Actually, we were paying the, um, the, 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 the kids, right? So we got to... Um, um, to the situation where we had to decide whether that was a good decision to take to change our kit supplier that was not a very premium brand. So at that time we discussed this and we said okay on the short term this is fantastic financially 
but on the long run this is inconsistent yeah. because our objective was to create the most the most the coolest club in the world so you have to associate yourself with those brands right so it was not a good financial decision but you have to do to be consistent with the long-term strategy but since i don't want to talk just about my personal experience and i have to give credits also to the competitors right there is another football club in spain again it's in the fourth division spanish football is marbella marbella fc they are doing an amazing job they have a similar strategy they want to be a coolest the coolest club in the world as well and they are actually planning actually they are going to start the construction of a new stadium, 18,000 um, capacity stadium, brand new, uh, very modern, very uh, uh, understanding, because uh, they realize that the long-term strategy must be more important than the sporting results right now. So they, they are another example of an emerging club that is thinking ahead and is establishing themselves as a reference in modern football, despite the sporting results. Long-term planning and football don't go very well together, but I, I've always thought that the, the entire thrust of the club licensing program, recognizing the differences in each, in each league, in each federation, in each country, each economy, each football um, tradition, those core principles that you outlined, the one, two, three, they come through in that club licensing to help clubs eventually, essentially plan for the long term, plan for the future. Exactly. And not just concentrate, Raj, coming to you as, um, you know, first thing we talked about this morning was your 1-0 win last night, because that's absolutely your focus. You bring a perspective from England to Scotland now to the ISL um, with Adista. What are, the, what are the similarities, what are the differences that you found in those those very different football economies. Yeah, there's there's two two aspects to it. So having worked in uh, English football or British football for over 25 years, you're you're conditioned to think a certain way and work a certain way in football. And when I made the move to uh, to Odisha Football Club, uh, who play in the Indian Super League in India, you have to immerse yourself in the culture. You have to adapt, and you, you have to, that, that doesn't mean you compromise your, your, your principles, but it's, it's bringing the best practices to the game, but also understanding how, how the, uh, the, the host country operates. So just to give you an example, uh, perhaps in England, if I expect uh, any reports, and I'll say by the close of business, it's normally, it's normally given to you by four or five o'clock, but in India it could be 11, 12 o'clock. So that's just a, just a small example. And, and, and going on from that context, from a, from a business perspective, what, I've, uh, what I understand is now in England, irrespective of, of the club you support, if it's a championship club, League One, League Two, businesses generally tend to support uh, your, your local club. It's the culture. And irrespective of where you are in the pyramid, in the football pyramid, the investment is, is proportionate to that. Now in India, there's a different culture. They they tend to support the the winner, shall we say, or or the best or the best uh, team. And only one team can win a cup. Only one team can win the league. And cricket, as we all know, is the is the number one sport. But rather than see that as a weakness, we draw inspiration from that because you are talking of a population of 1.4 billion people. And prior to in, uh, India winning the the World Cup, the Cricket World Cup in 1983, it was hockey. Prior to hockey, football was was quite uh, was quite popular, and what I've what I've seen with businesses now is that we've tried to adapt and 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 perhaps navigate our way around uh, the the way they operate. So, for instance, we've we've now created a community department, which which has been going in England for over thirty years, and the community department how we how we work around that is to support local boys, girls, and families, and the the key pillars of the engagement strategy is based around gender equality, education, um, and, and exercise through sports. And, and the whole purpose of this is that companies, it aligns with their objectives, with their goals, irrespective of whether they're football fans or not, but it amplifies the football club and it helps us bring and engage with people that perhaps were, were, not, were not associated with the football club. And, and the other trend in India is that certain organizations if they if they generate so much revenue or profit 
have to put two to three percent of their of, of that profit back into charities. So, so this is how, how we are trying to, to, to monetize and capitalize in India. So there is a stark difference between Europe, possibly certainly England, and in India, but it's, it's how we navigate our way around that. And, uh, and as, as you've quite rightly mentioned, uh, even the infrastructure on and off the pitch, we've tried to change. Uh, and, and, and slowly but, but surely, it's what I've experienced over the last three years, it's, it's growing. Football now, you know, you're getting numbers of two to 300 million people watching the game. Now, in India, compared to cricket, it might not be huge, and I'm using cricket for, for a reason, but yet in some countries, in, in some, some continents, that's huge figures, and they shouldn't be dismissed. Uh, and football, the trajectory of, of football in India is growing and continuing to grow, uh, and, I, and I'm proud of that. I spend a lot of time in India, as we were talking about, Raj, and um, the, the growth of football, what the ISL in particular has done is remarkable. Obviously, I have to always mention Kabaddi when I'm talking about Indian sport, but we'll talk about that uh, another time. Just interested in the context of this very different market you're operating, your owners, I guess, set you objectives like any business would. If you were to say what those three, five core objectives are for you right now, what would they be? Do you mean business in business terms? The football club as a business. The football yes. club as a business. Winning games is a bit of a given, but... Uh... Of course, every, every football club looks to become sustainable, but what we've tried to do is look at it from a global perspective. So in terms of we've, we've created a global football alliance, um, and, and the whole purpose of that is to work with clubs across the, across the world. So we have a partnership with Watford Football Club, my former club, um, we have a partnership with Avaí in Brazil, and and obviously the reason I'm here today is to is to is to build partnerships with with this region because I feel that what you will find is that in Europe it's it's growing and it's continuing to grow, but we also have to come together in Asia, and and you know I look at Saudi Arabia and I look at other teams in the region who you know domestically internationally are doing so well, but as a region we can all elevate, we can all become something. And, and, and as I said, this will only help uh, our, you know, Asia as, as a whole. And, and you know, yesterday, the, and also going back to your, your points, the other objective is, is the infrastructure. So on the pitch as well, we, 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 we sort of invest in science. Uh, statistics aren't the only thing, but we do invest in science. Our facilities are arguably the best in, in India, uh, thanks to the, uh, to the government of Odisha. So our training facilities, right through the training ground, right through to, to nutrition. We have a psychologist. So we've professionalized the whole club um, with, the, with the aim of globalizing. Now, people use the word globalizing loosely, but the whole purpose is, is to bring businesses on board. You know, when you're talking about social media factors um, and you're talking about the media, you, you are talking 1.4 billion people and they are sports fans. And after yesterday's uh, win, I only found out we, 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 we progressed through the, 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 to the AFC knockout stages when, when, when we landed, which has helped me this, this the next couple of days. Um, it just shows the measure of the club and how far we're coming. So there's, there's a number of areas, uh, Nick, that we need to, need to improve on. I accept that. But it's, but it's, it's progress. And, and what I've seen a, a, across the club now is that we are being, uh, you know, we, we only had an event at the House of Lords only two, three months ago. Uh, with the uh, so so we're trying to, to to bring businesses on board from right across the board and in India like I said when you talk about community you talk about other factors there's player sponsorship so th there's 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 other projects that we can bring on board to help companies from from who have a small amount to, to spend to to right across your shirts you know to, to millions um, and and that's I think is a short to mid term is what we're trying to do but we're doing it in stages okay and that's how we're trying to, to develop. You raised multi-club ownership, partnership type principles. You also talked about globalization. You, you, you switched effortlessly between global and local, which I guess a good football executive should do. And maybe we'll come to those themes in a second. But Thomas, it is about winning, ultimately winning games. Um, you can have the greatest plan in the world, but if you're, if you're losing, suddenly it's not so, such a good plan. Um, from a football perspective, from what you've seen, where do you think are the hallmarks of a really good club from a football perspective? We had Michael on here um, earlier on with his fascinating role, role, role here now in the kingdom after, after Chelsea. So he has interesting perspectives. Your perspectives on that. When you look for a 
a good football culture, a good football philosophy. What are the hallmarks of that? So, first of all, thank you, Nick. Thank you uh, to the organizers of World Football Summit and uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for hosting this amazing event. Uh, to me, I've been 10 years, I've been sporting, uh, a sports agent, and then I've been sporting director and CEO to several clubs. Uh, to me, uh, stability is key to a successful club. And uh, by stability, I mean that you need to have a clear vision, uh, as Ornella said, uh, a strategy, a clear strategy that you set up uh, and um, you communicate also to the public, to the fans, to reduce noise, to reduce um, false expectations um, from, from, from media and from fan side. And then uh, you need to uh, stick to this strategy and um, operate in every part of the club. It doesn't matter if it's a recruitment or a coach or players uh, recruitment. Uh, you need to um, get the best people on and off the pitch. You need to um, like follow the plan, best man, best woman for the job. And uh, because uh, I witnessed it in my, in my steps of career that uh, if you choose the wrong person for the right, for the right um, position, in the end, it will throw you way back. And I speak about its professional quality, its mentality, its character. You need to create like a family surrounding inside the club to be successful and stay, stay, um, stay on the line. Don't don't uh, let emotions drive you. Like uh, one one sporting director from the Premier League, which I know, said to me once, uh, "No decisions on Monday." So uh, don't take too fast uh, the, the decisions made on the based on emotions. And uh, yeah, so. This is, I think, the, the most important part. And sometimes in clubs which are more traditional and has a big background, you have to start from the scratch because uh, a lot of clubs, they are, it's big names, big brands, they don't even have a scouting department and then you have to create it from the scratch. And this is a long process, but you have to communicate all the steps publicly and very clear and stick to them. I like that phrase and I heard it um, very recently from Paul Barber, who's the chief exec at Brighton and Hove Albion, currently you know, having a great time in the Premier League. He said that one of his top top tips was shut out the noise. Exactly. You've got you've 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 got to be aware that you are part of a globally fascinating sports entertainment business. That's what we're all involved in ultimately. But in order to get the best out of your team, in every sense, you have to create that calm focus. Exactly. Exactly. Easily said. <laughs> this is football, obviously not so easily done. Before I move on to um, Jordi, I just want to ask you another question, Thomas. And this is another quote which I. I carry with me from, um, this is David Dean, um, Arsenal Football Club, legendary character. He always says that the single most important feature is choosing your owner when it comes to looking around and uh, trying to assess the um, uh, opportunities in football. Would you say that? I mean, it's again, quite easily said, but I think what he means was try to really understand what the motivations are for the people who you will ultimately be working for. To have the right owner is, uh, is crucial, I, I would say, because I worked for a club which was privately owned. I've worked for a club who was government owned. So it's slightly different um, strategic um, ways of work or deal with the owner. But in the end, uh, my, close, my close friend, uh, Ralph Ragnick, who worked for Hoffenheim, worked for Red yeah. Bull, for example. He had the big benefit that the owner always want by himself to be successful and to invest into the development of the football club. Sometimes you have the owners a lot of a lot of clubs in Russia actually has that that they uh, they like more or less have to deal with the clubs and they just run them as they run and they don't really want to develop them forward. So uh, it's important to have the right mindset on the owner side too, of course. Jordi, concepts like shutting out the noise and stability in possibly the fastest moving, most exciting football story globally right now. These might seem like two months into your job, these might seem like concepts which um, you know, are quite far away from you at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you are involved right at the heart with Al Nasser of the, um, of the roller coaster ride. Um, uh, how, how's that going for you, I suppose, would be the, uh, the starting question. Yeah. Thank you, Nick, and good morning, everybody. Thank you for, uh, for having me here. Um, it's true, it's been two very hectic months. These two months, they look like maybe three years, it's like doing a, a proper master in, uh, in sports and business. I truly believe that if you are a, a business professional and also a sports lover, there's no better place to be uh, in this moment. So it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity. And, and then we have a bright future uh, ahead of us. Uh, I just want to reconnect what Thomas just said about the, the ownership, right? 
I'm, I'm quite lucky to, to have an owner that is very ambitious, meaning that we have the possibility to dream big. And when people ask us if it's, if it's something that is going to last only a few years, I, I, I definitely say that it's, it's a no. And this has been a show by the fact that 2034, we are uh, actually aiming to host the World Cup. And when you aim to host a World Cup, like an Olympic Games, what you, what you want is to build a, a, a base of local talent. And this is what in Al Nasser we are, uh, we are trying to do. And because it's true, in 10 months, it completely changed the landscape. And this means that we need to change in two main areas. First one, the technical area, because the moment you onboard on your team uh, champions like uh, Cristiano, Brozovic, Mane, Laporte, Otavio, so players that are used to top teams like uh, Liverpool, Real Madrid, uh, Manchester United, City and Oporto, we need also as an organization to step up and be ready to uh, support them and satisfy their needs. Then, of course, there is the other part, the one that I'm, I'm actually in charge of, which is the, let's say, more the, the branding part and the commercial. Also, this one needs to move together with the technical part. So if technical goes up, the commercial also needs to move up. It's about the image that we are uh, uh, showing to the world. I cannot have a team that wins championships and leagues and not having the, the right brand uh, uh, associated to it. That's why now what we are doing is, um, is uh, working very strong on building the brand. We are uh, trying and I think that so far we've been very successful in becoming an international brand. I always like to, to repeat a, a, a statement that it's, it's my vision. It's, I'm, I'm trying to, to repeat it to myself uh, every day that we want to become the, the best Arab team in the world. At the moment, probably we are the best team in the Arab world. So it's, it's a completely shift in the mindset. And this is it's something that we're trying to transfer in all across the club, starting from the sporting side to the actually the, the supporting, uh, the supporting uh, staff to the, to the first team. What we're trying to do is to internationalize the brand. How we do it? Of course, we need to leverage our international players. We have an amazing opportunity and we need to take the, the most out of it. But I'm going to use the international players also to talk about my local players. It's very important. Imagine that our local players one year ago, they were playing in a league that was not very popular on the wall, while in 10 months they become top five in the wall and number two in the region. Meaning that also our players, they had to, to face a new world, right? They have to face uh, uh, the, the media attention that they never had before. And that's why we have very good international players that actually they, they came to Saudi with the right mindset and the right approach. I come here to play and I come here to make, to improve the ecosystem. Improving the ecosystem means helping my local players to become professionals. And this is seen, as I said, across all the areas. It's not only about the communication and branding, but it's also bringing the best professionals in the medical area, physiotherapy area, in the technical direction of the team, because this is what our international players are expecting. Really interesting, Jordi, obviously my experience, mostly Premier League. Um, so that's the model I, I know best. I'm really interested in your perspective, and then Raj, I'll come to you from an ISL perspective. That question, can you, how, how much are you working as an entire league ESO ecosystem? Do you, do you see your absolute priority as Al Nasser and, and you've just articulated, you know, the, the rather substantial assets you have, um, uh, uh, under your control, uh, okay. at, the, at the moment. Clear. But how much are you feeling yourself as being actually part of driving the pro league, the Saudi pro league as a whole? How much is it a collaborative effort at that? Or how much are you absolutely focused on your club? Yeah. I mean, it's, um, when I said it's a great opportunity uh, to, 
to uh, cover this role in Al Nasser, it's also because you have the kind of responsibility of, of the full league. Uh, Al Nasser is the most popular team around the world, and this means also that we have the eyes of the world on us. If Al Nasser is successful, the league will be successful. If the league so far has been successful, it's also because uh, Al Nasser has been doing an amazing job, and also because we have um, great players that bring the name of Al Nasser and the league around the world. My focus, of course, is, is Al Nasser. I'm a, an employee of Al Nasser, and of course, it has implication on the league. Uh, we're going to start working uh, closely with the league to understand how we can uh, improve the product or the overall product. Because at the end, a league that is uh, built on a individual, uh, on a single team, does not have enough uh, uh, room or uh, road to go. Meaning, we are here in a very collaborative uh, approach with the league. Let's try to make a, a, a better product, a product that hopefully is going to be the best one in the world. And we truly believe that it's going to be the best of the world. That's, that's the ambition. That's the long-term aspiration. That's why I always say that we are here to stay. My impression, Raj, is that the ISL is quite quite centralized in its view of um, promoting the league and therefore the role is less for the clubs. Is, is that right? What's, what, same question for you. How much of your life is club and league? Club and league. Um, the league, I mean, it's like any league around the world. They're there to, to, to enhance the clubs. Um, but going back to, to, what, to what these gents said, that most of my role is obviously club, club related. Yeah. Uh, because if the clubs do well, and, and echoing what uh, what Jordy just said, that if, 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 whether it's Adisha in my in my case, if we progress, we continue to progress in Asia, then it not just enhances the Indian Super League; it's good for football uh, across India. And and as I said, there are pockets of, of areas in India where where football is is the uh, the main sport. And uh, and if we can move the dial. Even sm uh, in, in a small way, it, it will help the, uh, the, the the whole sport in the ecosystem in India, certainly in football. But from a league and a football perspective, you know, we, we get involved as much as we need to. Um, uh, but I, I would say that it's it's no different to any other other organisation or governing body across the world, really. If the, if that's okay, what you're looking for. Ornella, we talked about what a good club might look like. I think uh, just as interesting perhaps to the audience is what alarm bells uh, you can see. And I'm going to start with you and Thomas, I'm going to come to you next in relation to this question. When you're looking at a club and you're thinking, hmm, that doesn't look so good. Are there, any, are there any particular aspects that stand out to you? Look, from a financial perspective, merely financial perspective, I look at the wages to revenue ratio. This is a very, very important indicator about the health of the club, right, financially. Even though we must admit that it doesn't always uh, mean that for all the clubs is the same because every club is a unique ecosystem. So you have to understand also what is the motivation and what is the long-term strategy. So in principle, especially, for example, for well-established football club, clubs, uh, um, alarming situation is when the wages to turnover ratio is over 80 90 percent then it's some something wrong is uh, is happening but of course as uh, as i said before you have to consider for example for an emerging clubs or clubs that want to establish themselves in a very competitive market globally of course they have to invest in the short term at least uh, on the salary of players so we cannot make a general uh, things around that but definitely this is uh, one of the main aspect and this is also what makes me sad when i see that for example in decades of incredible growth many clubs especially many top clubs have been like cash burning machines that have been unable to implement a sustainable business model i think that's not really what a club is supposed to do, right? So, and this is for the merely financial um, 
aspect. When it comes to those intangible things that I was talking about, well, uh, I look a lot at, for example, uh, also to follow up on what Thomas and you said before, the motivation. What's the long-term strategy, right? And you have to make sure that every decision that you take in the club is in line. So, for example, when, uh, as Thomas has to look for the motivation of the owner, also the owner has to look for the motivation in the people he hires, especially the key people. So, if you are an owner that just want to keep a safe place in your league, don't bring in a high-performer guy. Because then the guy won't actually perform well, you know, because he will feel frustrated. It doesn't align, you know, with your vision. So I think there are a good examples in European football, right? Or when maybe you bring in the wrong person. And I perform for a club that just wants to survive in a league and the other way around. So I think this is uh, one of those things that must... Uh, be considered. You'll leave the audience to keep guessing as to who you're thinking about in European football when you say that. I think that's, that's, that's Don't let fair. me say that. <laughs> Thomas, would you agree with that? Would you agree with those yes. alarm bells that you... For sure, for sure. When we speak about league and, and club relationship, of course, the league always sells the product and the club is the product that they can sell. Um, for every club on the sportive perspective, it's important to have the highest possible competition to, to grow sport-wise. And uh, if a club is performing in a, in, a, in a weak league or in a small league, um, of course it needs uh, to have, the, to have the, um, the target to dominate the domestic championship to be number one. Uh, this can be done anywhere in the world. When the club is in a, in a shell, you can create uh, infrastructure, you can create uh, coach, coach education, coach development, players development inside your shell, and you can be successful inside any league which is not that big when it, it's not like in Premier League, it's more difficult to make than in a smaller league. Um, and the next step is to be successful internationally. And I think this is, uh, this is what the smaller leagues, uh, for example, when, it, when you go 15 years back, um, the Austrian Bundesliga was a small league, but uh, Red Bull and Salzburg uh, created a machine of developing players, selling players, which are now global player and transfer on the transfer market and selling players and becoming extremely successful sport-wise and, and financial-wise in the revenues. So I think, yes, the clubs. Um, Interested, Thomas, before we move to perhaps the last, the last phase of our last, um, last question, um, the theme of partnership, multi-club ownership, there's almost a presumption now, I had the honor of um, being part of a panel at the World Football Summit in Sevilla earlier on, where there's kind of an assumption now that a successful club is going to be part of a network partnership, yeah. multi-club ownership. Would you agree with that? And I think Raj, you, you you touched on this before. Would you agree with that as a, as a yeah? That's the where the where the business going. Thomas first. Yeah. yeah, for me, for me, yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, multi-club ownership is a is a model that is becoming more and more popular in the in the global world of football. And uh, for me, it's uh, it's it has benefits for like network sharing, um, uh, sharing of knowledge, uh, scouting wise, uh, medical department wise, uh, transfer uh, not transfer but development of players by loaning the players, the young players, to a to a smaller club to let them play on a high level. Uh, on the other side, you have also to, uh, as an owner, you have the um, uh, risk uh, diversification that you can, you can like, when you have several clubs, you can sh uh, spit uh, the money across the, the different clubs and you have an um, amortization of, of costs if uh, something goes wrong in one of the clubs. And, uh, but uh, I think you have to, which uh, one, one important topic is the, uh, to keep the, uh, the fairness of the competition still, like mm. when you play internationally or whatever, that you don't collapse with the same owner. But for me, it's, it's, a, it's a very good model, yeah, the future. Jordi, part of the club's thinking? Partnerships globally? Yes. Um, as, um, as I said before, we are trying to internationalize our brand. So that's why now also our our focus is in looking for international partnerships but then also what we are trying to do is uh, prioritize the sponsors or the partners that that actually will uh, will uh, ride along us why i'm saying this because what i'm looking for is for partners that actually are gonna enhance my brand internationally and that's why what we're looking for is it's brands that share our values our vision 
And then also, it's not only about how much investment they're gonna uh, make on us or how much actually money they're gonna give it to us as uh, in terms of a sponsorship. It's not about value in kind, but it's about how much you're gonna invest on my brand, meaning how much you want my brand to be associated to yours around the world. But then also we have the case of local brands that are very interested in going globally and going internationally. So also in this case, we are, we are quite lucky that we have very important uh, brands in Saudi that are interested to, to be present in the, in the global markets and that's why they, they choose um, Al Nasser. So here, we need to find the right balance between international and local brands. Also because the, the assets that, uh, that we have in the club are, are limited and then also our main assets that are the players and that are the, the most uh, requested um, uh, asset for, uh, by, the, by the sponsors are also sportsmen. So it's true, it's, uh, it's a business, but if I have to be successful, my team needs to continue winning. That's why also as a, as a former sportsman and, and athlete, I'm, I'm very respectful of the, of the sporting side. So for me, it's very important to have always this um, direct communication with the, with the sporting team and open and on a daily basis, because at the end, our players are human beings and as human beings, they sometimes are sick, sometimes they don't feel like uh, uh, advertising a, a, a brand. So we need to understand all these dynamics because what we want to give to our sponsors are the athletes in their best conditions. Because at the end, it's about making both brands better. My colleague Wissam from Portus is uh, moderating the next session. I think he's getting jumpy that we should be um, coming to the conclusion quite rightly. So we're going to move to our final question. Um, we football people, we tend to think in seasons, not, not calendar years. But as we're looking into 2024, Ornella, and you're thinking FIFA and your mission in relation to professional football, priority for you? Yeah, <clears throat> look, I, I think it's important here to understand that FIFA is doing a lot about club football as well. Of course, we are, we are the football governing body, but we really care about club football. And this is the reason why we are implementing a lot of projects that are designed and in line with our president's vision, the vision to create a more competitive and appealing ecosystem where not just a few clubs from a specific part of the world are running the show, but we want to create as an ecosystem where at least 50 clubs from all around the world are able to compete at that level on and off the pitch. And they are able to dream big. So how do we make that a reality? So first of all, the Club World Cup, the new format of the Club World Cup that will be uh, implemented for the first time in 2025, this is just a reflection of this vision because many people say, oh, FIFA is creating a new competition. No, there is a, a beautiful narrative behind that that is supported by data. We don't like the fact that the top 30 clubs in, uh, in Europe generate a combined revenue that is equal to the rest of the clubs in the whole world. We don't agree with the fact that the clubs winning the Club World Cup is always a club from Europe most of the time. So in our um, uh, vision as football's governing body, we have to do our best to make sure that everybody is put in a condition at least to compete at that level. So the Club World Cup is just a, is a, just a game changer. It's going to change completely club football, I think, at uh, the elite level, definitely, uh, giving more possibility to more clubs from all around the world, not just from Europe. Then um, the FIFA Diploma in Club Management is uh, not just an academic course, is uh, a, pl a place where all these executives, top executives from clubs all over the world are able to build relationship by growing the game for their respective clubs. And this is a way for FIFA to democratize knowledge and access to knowledge. So all those smaller clubs are given the opportunity to learn from the best and implement their own uh, strategy in their own clubs. And here is important also to stress that, for example, we ask them not just to come and listen and that's it and go back home to their own clubs. What 
but we oblige them to make a strategic plan for their clubs and to look at where they want to see the club in 10 years time so they have to do the job so uh, then we have a league and club professionalization program you know that <laughs> because you're very familiar with it so uh, basically we assist leagues clubs in bringing the all competition to the next level uh, by uh, changing governance uh, aspects by improving the selling of TV rights by understanding the importance of competitive balance in a competition because football is a collective sport and as any other collective sport the all is greater than the sum of its parts right and this is some it's a concept that is not very well understood in European football where where the individual interests always you know overcome the the collective interest as a, as a league guy obviously i agree completely as a league with guy, you you are, you you agree of course and if you look for example even for uh, the, the mls so all the clubs were helping miami to get messy because they realized miami is not just a competitor right because we can make our pie bigger and if the pie is bigger, everybody is going to benefit uh, from it. So um, the league and club professionalization program is focused on that. We also organize a lot of workshops for clubs, for players, because we want to make sure that everybody in the whole ecosystem, not just the federation or the league, they are all aligned. They understand what's the final objective. Uh, then um, the club benefit program. So. After the World Cup, FIFA redistributes uh, money, funds to all the clubs that have released their players during the Club World Cup. So we, uh, I've been in charge as uh, the Director of Professional Football uh, Relations and Development with the process. So we just redistributed 209 million to more than 440 clubs all over the world. And it's amazing how a club from Costa Rica got more than 1 million US dollar just for releasing the players or a club, I don't, rem I don't remember from uh, really club uh, countries that are not big football um, countries or are not big uh, football clubs. And they got the opportunity from FIFA, you know, uh, receiving the, this amount that they can reinvest in sport, in uh, uh, player development and infrastructure. Uh, and just to finish, as of the next World Cup, it will be played in North America. FIFA will redistribute 355 million to the clubs. So no longer 209. So I just want to make sure that, you know, this message is also conveyed because- It's gonna be a busy year, I think, 2024. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Usually we always get criticized. Whatever we do, FIFA is always criticized. So I think there is a, there are so many good things we are doing that maybe don't get uh, the right attention and I wanted to to also stress that so thank you thank you Raj 15 30 seconds your 2024 key learning that you're going to carry into that year um, in the club in the club in Adisha it's uh, on the pitch to ensure that we we continue uh, the success that we've we brought to continue with the uh, with the science that we're bringing in talk about multi-club ownership. We're working with a number of clubs uh, to, to elevate uh, the, the club itself and also off the pitch that we, uh, that we support the local people, the communities and, uh, and businesses look at us in a different way. I mean, we could speak all day. 30 seconds is a difficult one, to be honest, but there's, uh, there's so much more. You now have five left. And that's where we are. That's where we're going with it. So, uh, yeah, to see success for the club, that's what everybody ultimately wants. And, uh, and as I said, there's a number of, uh, of attributes and and areas that you need to look at. So, uh, but as I said, you could speak all day about this, can't you? So, Thomas. Yeah, for me, it's uh, uh, the globalization process, which is going on in the football world. You can see that I think Saudi Arabia is a uh, uh, key player in that case, also the MLS. Um, so for me, uh, an advice for 2024 is to, uh, to uh, take care of your network, um, be productive, use such events like this. And yeah, and. And Jordi, for you and Alasa. No, for me, it's, a, it's an invite to everybody to come and enjoy the show, but also present history. Because what is happening now, it's, uh, 
it's something that probably our our kids and grandsons will study on the on the books of history that at some point the sports ecosystem moved to this region this region went through a complete cultural uh, change and it all started with a football match an inspiring note on which to end ladies and gentlemen your panel thank you thank you